it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's been a wonderful month in Bonn. It's a, it's a really great place. Unfortunately, I have to leave at the end of the week, so <laughs> that's, my, that's my last week here. So I'm going to talk about this, um, I'm going to talk about the problem in care spaces. And uh, we're interested in the question of uh, global stability of a stationary actually symmetric solution of the wave map equation. And uh, this particular is a particular solution. It's a very special solution. Not only not only the solution of the uh, wave map equation, but it's also uh, it's also generated by a killing vector field. So it's not not a general solution. It's one that's generated by a killing vector field. Now, uh, just uh, to be able to to get started, we are looking at uh, the care space, the family of spaces. They depend on two parameters, a and m. They're a little bit complicated to write down the metric, so one should think that one should think more of the picture than the exact form of the metric. So this is the picture, and this is the, the r is equal to r h, so a certain value of the horizon. We are in three plus one dimensions, so this is this is like the time if you want it to be like the foliation, the time foliation of the uh, of the space, and they are looking only in the forward picture. So now we have a metric. Uh, that depends on two parameters. It depends on the uh, uh, the parameter m, uh, which is the mass of the uh, the mass of the the black hole. It's a black hole solution of the Einstein vacuum equation, and the parameter a, which is the angular momentum. Uh, and the metric itself, so it's it's all an explicit metric. Uh, it reads. You, you, you can compare it with the metric in. Uh, uh, you could compare it to the metric. Uh, the Minkowski metric, if you think of the, um, of the Minkowski metric in polar coordinates, so in R, theta, phi, and T coordinates, uh, then if you think in R, theta, phi, and T coordinates and ignore uh, all the lower the terms, then that would, this, would count, this would look exactly like the Minkowski metric, so it would be, you'd ignore 2M R minus A squared, so that will be uh, basically 1 minus DT2, and then this would be sine theta squared d phi squared, and then this would be uh, this would be gr squared, and this would be a certain coefficient times d theta squared. So as, uh, asymptotically, as r goes to infinity, this looks very much, so if you think that the infinity is in this direction, this looks very much like the uh, Minkowski space. Now, one, as one goes towards the middle of the manifold, uh, this, this is very different from Minkowski space. It turns out, in fact, if you just look at the metric, there's a problem in the metric when uh, delta is equal to zero, which means that r is a certain value, and that's uh, so the metric is not well defined there in this form. It has to be changed, and that corresponds to uh, uh, to that corresponds to the black hole. It's not a real singularity of the problem, so it's not a real singularity in the metric. It can be changed in a way to make uh, the metric smoother. And uh, if we look at the metric, the metric has two killing vector fields, d by dt and d by d phi, the same way as uh, the Minkowski space. Also the case uh, little a is equal to zero, it's a simpler case. Uh, so in that case, it's the, the Schwarzschild metric. So that's a more restricted family. And they are looking at one specific solution of the, of the uh, wave map equation, which is the Ernst potential associated to uh, the killing vector field D. And the Ernst potential is A plus ID, so it has two components, A and D. Uh, the first component is just the length of the vector field, and the second component is the conjugate function. I'm going to give a general definition. So it's uh, in the in the care space itself, it has a formula, but in general, what can be defined is in general space time. The second component of the Ernst potential, and uh, and the equation that this uh, Ernst potential satisfies is the usual, is the wave map equation. The wave map equation. Wh one should think that a and a and b, a is the component. It's supposed to be strictly positive, so when if you think of the uh, hyperbol if the hyperbolic space, then A is uh, supposed to be positive, and B is the uh, the other component of hyperbolic space, and this is how the equation is: is A is box A is equal to some sort of gradient in A and B, and box B is some other gradient uh, of A and B. So this is the uh, so this is the, this is the this is what I'm going to call from now on the wave map equation. So it's uh, the, the interpretation is that, that A and B would be valued. We, we are going to think of them as real valued functions, but the, the interpretation is that they would be uh, valued into the uh, hyperboloid. Uh, and now we are 
raising, so the one, one qu question one could raise is the global stability of the wave map equation. So uh, the global stability in this case would, would say the following. We start with this stationary solution, uh, A comma B, and we are thinking, and we are thinking of the, so we are thinking of the uh, perturbation of the per perturbations of the stationary solution, and uh, the the question that we are raising is this: uh, is, uh, is the stationary solution a comma b is it stable? So now to put it again on the board, so this is the solution that we start with, which is the Ernst potential associated with the killing vector field z in the uh, in the care space. This is the wave map equation as in uh, as regarded as a, as a function as a uh, solution from the uh, from the care space to the hyperboloid and we are uh, and the question is is this uh, is stable and now the reason why uh, now uh, of course this the question of global regularity of wave maps has been studied a lot and uh, in Euclidean space been studied a lot and uh, by now there's a very very good theory in two dimensions and uh, I, I just put a few names I'm probably missing a lot of names of people who worked on wave maps, starting with Kleinemann Makedon, Sataru, Tau, Shota Struve, Kleinemann Rodniansky, Sherman Sataru, Krieger Slug, and Tau. I'm just thinking of some of the work that was done for as far as regularity of the wave maps goes in Euclidean spaces. Now, in our case, we are not interested in the global regularity for itself. There's a good motivation to be thinking about the global regularity of this particular wave map. So it's a very particular wave map, uh, of perturbation of this particular wave map. And the reason is that if we are thinking only of the actually symmetric problem, so from now on I'm only going to be in the actually symmetric world. Only in the actually, if we are thinking only in the actually symmetric problem, then the einstein vacuum equations can be very simply described in terms of the dynamics of the wave. So more precisely, assume that we have, uh, so assume even uh, even in general, assume that we have a metric uh, that uh, satisfies the Einstein vacuum equation, open domain, and we have a killing vector field for this metric. Uh, then we can construct the projected metric on a co-dimension one manifold, and that projected metric has a certain form. It's x times d alpha beta minus d alpha d beta, where x is the length of the vector, and this would be on a co-dimension one manifold. And then in this co-dimension one manifold, the equations become extremely simple. So the equation for the metric is the Ricci is basically a gradient, a Hessian of, I'm sorry, a gradient of the, uh, of the wave map, so Ricci of the, so the metric is determined, the, the moral of this uh, is that the metric is determined through the Ricci tensor because we're on a three-dimensional manifold, the Ricci determines the Riemann tensor, so the metric is determined from the, uh, from the wave map, and the wave map itself satisfies, so the function x and y satisfies the wave map equation relative to this metric. And now, uh, now I postpone up to here. So in general, one can define the Ernst potential associated to a vector field. So this could be associated to V. Any vector field you have in the in the manifold that satisfies the Einstein vacuum equations uh, admits an Ernst potential, and uh, this would be the formula. It turns out that uh, this is integrable, so one can define this as a potential. So the picture, if you want, uh, in the actually symmetric world, is that the uh, the wave map is related, the metric is sometimes determined elliptically by the wave map, and the wave map captures all the, uh, the dynamics of the evolution. And the procedure is reversible, so one doesn't, one actually doesn't have to go to three dimensions, it's a little bit clumsy to go to three dimensions because the equations are short. So once you have the, uh, once you have the metric in the co-dimension one picture and the wave map, up to a gauge invariance, one can determine back the, uh, one can determine back the full metric. So uh, in some sense, one can think that the stability of this particular wave map A plus IB uh, associated to actually symmetric uh, to the actually symmetric vector field is consistent with the full nonlinear stability of the care family of solutions. If you think that you have full nonlinear stability, then uh, only for, for actually symmetric objects, then in principle, the metric will want to converge to, uh, in the long run, the metric would want to converge to uh, so we'll want to exist for a long time and perhaps converge to another metric. And this would make the wave map want to converge to the corresponding wave map according to the, uh, to the stability. Now, of course, uh, consistent doesn't mean that uh, it's equivalent in no way. It's much harder to prove the full nonlinear stability, but we identify another linearization of, of this uh, uh, relative to, 
another another simple simple problem uh, that, that constantly changes the non linear stability. Now, if one wants to think the simplest possible problem of this type, the simplest possible non linear stability question is to think of uh, the stability of the Schwarzschild family in the class of actually symmetric perturbations with real Ernst potentials. So we are thinking, if we, one can think only of actually symmetric perturbations, and it turns out that uh, the wave map equation, if we look at it again, uh, the wave map equation, if B was starting out being zero, then B would stay zero for all time. So everything is stable as long as if, if the Ernst, po Ernst potential starts out as zero, it will stay zero, so this will be constant through the stability of the Schwarzschild family. Uh, so again, this is the uh, this is the equation. Now, um, <coughs> if one is thinking of the full problem, then so th this is the equation. Now we are thinking that we have a general solution of this uh, of this equation, presumably that stays close to our original solution. If one is thinking of the full uh, problem, there's been a lot of linearizations that have been proposed, uh, and starting with the cheap, the simplest one would be just the wave equation, box u is box u is equal to zero. Then one can look at Maxwell equations, one can look at linearization of the null structure equations. So this is a more recent linearization of uh, Olsego slash Hermann Sandrandiansky. One can also consider this in Schwarzschild and in shared spaces. And one can try to analyze these problems with the hope of understanding the dynamics of, um, of solutions of wave equations. And I put here some work that was done. It's not intended to be Comprehensive. It's just intended to give some idea of the people who worked on this. So it goes back to Kay and Wald, Blue and Sofer, Blue and Sherman, Sinister, Tamran, Smaller and Yao, Dafermos and Rodiansky, Madrola, Metcalf, Tatar and Tohenanu, Tatar and Tohenanu, Anderson, Blue, Luke, Stand and Tatar, Dafermos, Rodiansky and Schlapento, uh, Grossman, and Dafermos, Holtiger and Rodiansky. So these are many problems. I, I didn't divide them. So some of them have to do with wave equations, like the first, the, the, the first ones. Afterwards, uh, one can also study the Maxwell equation. One can also even study the spin two system, and one can study semilinear problems. So, uh, so now we can linearize our problem. And let's see what 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 happens when we linearize. So looking for solutions of the wave map equation of the form. A prime B prime is equal to A plus B plus a perturbation. And it's important to keep an A in front of the perturbation. So everything is, uh, there's, there's some dimensional analysis. So the perturbation uh, has to be, uh, it's normalized relative to the, uh, to the original solution. And uh, after we do, so after we do, uh, there's a calculation one can do to understand the, linear, the linearization of the problem. And it turns out the linearization is not far from the wave equation, but it's not exactly the wave equation. So the linearization is, uh, there are two functions, phi and psi, that correspond to two components. And the first one satisfies an equation of four box phi minus two, and that this is a gradient term. And then, so this is a gradient term of form minus psi, and it's some free term of the form, some free term in phi and psi. And the second one is box psi, and then it's also a gradient term this time in phi, and then some zero to order term in, phi, in psi. And uh, there are nonlinearities that can be calculated explicitly. Um, now, so this is the uh, so this is the linearization. Now I wrote down the linear nonlinearities just to have a vague discussion about them, but I'm not going to. Th this is the only slide where we see the nonlinearity. The nonlinearities they are uh, they are well defined. So there are several things one has to think about. Uh, first of all, they are semi-linear. So this is a problem that's semi-linear, and uh, it has uh, they have. If one looks at them, they are terms of the form d mu phi d mu phi. So that's uh, uh, that's a gradient, a favorable gradient term that uh, that has null structure, and then there's d mu psi d mu psi. Uh, this, however, one thing that one has to be careful, which is the fact they are only defined if the function psi. Uh, vanishes on the axis. So this, uh, the, the problem doesn't make sense if the function psi doesn't vanish on the axis. And even the linear part here, it turns out that this term, d mu a, d mu a divided by a squared times psi, that only makes sense if the function psi uh, vanishes on the axis. So this is the problem that, uh, that counters the linearization of the, uh, of the, of the wave map equation. And now, um, 
So now we want to, uh, so now, uh, so, uh, so this is the uh, nonlinearity. And now, uh, one could try to do several things. So now the, uh, now one can see how, how one could go. So one could try to study this by uh, thinking of, there are several stages in one, uh, that one could do. One could think of uh, just studying the linearized problem. So the linearized problem would be just assuming no, uh, no nonlinearities. Then one could think of uh, uh, studying the, the nonlinear problem, which is putting in the, uh, the semi-linear nonlinearities. Non there also some. Uh, there is also a simpler case, uh, which is just to, uh, which is easier if we think about it, just to keep it in mind how these equations look, because these functions are kind of complicated. A and B, if one is to write down all the terms, uh, they turn out to be very complicated. Uh, but in the simplest case in which we are in the Schwarzschild case, then the system be coupled. It turns out that capital B is equal to zero. So capital B is the nth potential associated to the, uh, to the vector field B. And the equations decouple very nicely. And they are essentially of the form box phi is equal to zero. So the first one is just the wave equation. And the second one is box psi. And then this coefficient this minus 4 divided by r square sine theta square psi is equal to 0. And that exact form of the potential is very important. It's very important is 4 as opposed to 3, for example. Uh, and that's consistent with the fact that uh, psi would have to vanish on the axis. So the axis is when, set, when sine of theta is equal to 0 in order for, uh, for the equations to make sense. Uh, now, so we want, to set up, we want to set up a study for, uh, for this um, uh, for this problem, and uh, that leads two things that we need in order to be able to uh, to have to have a study. We need a no good notion of, of energy that ideally would be conserved, uh, ideally would be po a positive energy, and ideally it would be conserved. And we need some good function spaces. Uh, one could say that uh, just to work with the HS spaces, but of course one has to encode the fact that psi is supposed to be zero on the axis. So that's. Uh, so the, 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 so, the, so, so we need a, new, uh, a good function space for that. And now, uh, so now this is the first theorem. So uh, the first theorem is that uh, if we are looking at the linearized solution, the linearized equation, box box phi minus this first order term and minus this zero order term is equal to zero, and box psi the same way. And if assume that we are looking in an open set of the care space, and assume that psi varies on the axis. Uh, then we have an energy momentum tensor. So everything that we, so the, the structure of the equation, we can c uh, recover it in terms of an energy momentum tensor. And the energy momentum tensor has what are the right properties. It's uh, positive or future oriented time like vector fields X and Y. It has, it satisfies divergence equation D nu, Q mu nu is J nu. Now this J nu is not equal to zero. If one was to look at just at the solution of the wave equation, then the, uh, the J would be equal to zero. But it's not equal to zero, but at least it's normal to uh, the killing vector field dt, so it can still be used as, as a conservation law. And uh, moreover, we are only in the axially symmetric world. So uh, this Q has some, uh, so the Q is, uh, the Q is uh, compatible with the fact that we, are, we have a specific choice of a vector field z. So, uh, so the Q, Q of G and X is equal to zero for any vector field X that's normal to G. So these are the properties of our energy momentum tensor. And this is, uh, so uh, now we have to construct it. It's not, uh, if you just look at it, like it's very hard to see why, why is that you'd hope to have such an energy momentum tensor. If, if one was to look just at the wave equations, uh, then the Q mu nu would be, so Q mu nu for wave equations would be something like d nu phi d nu phi uh, minus one half d nu nu d alpha phi d alpha phi. So this is the Lagrangian term, and this is the uh, the gradient of phi. And so this would be the energy momentum test. It, it turns out that this energy momentum test would work uh, like uh, so. It would work like uh, the energy momentum test in our problem. In fact one would even have a simpler situation in the sense that uh, the, the divergence is equal to zero. Uh, now, there are several reasons why is there such, uh, such, uh, such a good structure. And um, I'm going to have an exact calculation. So this is just, uh, this is just motivation. I'm going to have an exact calculation on the next slide. 
Uh, but uh, the reason is the following. See, if one is looking for B and C in order to have something like this, it's uh, it's a manifestation of the nor uh, of uh, Noether's principle applied to linearized equations around solutions possessing a symmetry. So it's the, the point is we are looking at a solution that's stationary, and uh, we linearize around that. Uh, now the positivity. So the positivity is also very important. The positivity that's here has to do with the fact that we're in the defocusing case. So we are uh, in that case where the uh, the, the map where the, the map was named in the hyperboloid. And the last property has to do with the fact that everything is in the actually symmetric case. So so the, the, some, the, 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 Z, the Z vector here plays a role. And now this is the exact form of the of the energy momentum tensor, you have, you have some covariant derivatives of phi and psi. If one is looking at this formula, E would be the covariant derivative of phi, F would be the covariant derivative of psi, so that's the, uh, so that would be, the, because we have a system of phi and psi, and M would be a certain first order term. It turns out that uh, uh, the first order terms, so that this, this factor G mu A over A counts as a derivative because it has a one, one over sine theta in the denominator. So we have these three vectors that we construct out of the two solutions, phi and psi. And then one can construct the energy momentum tensor in the same way as for the usual wave equation. So you take E mu, E mu, and then we subtract off one half and the Lagrangian, one half G mu minus the Lagrangian, and then we do the same for F, and then we do the same for N. So the positivity, uh, the positivity is already encoded, for every component at a time, the positivity is encoded in the fact that it has this form, so whenever you have uh, some vector field of this form, it's, uh, there will be positivity of the, so this will be positive on, uh, on time-like vector field. Uh, the positivity for each one at a time, the point is also that they all come with plus. So in order to, uh, in order to have a full positivity, they all have to come with the same sign. And then one can do a calculation. So the calculation is that when we take when we take the divergence, so we take the divergence of this G mu mu, and we, call, we make it work with the equations, uh, then we produce a current J that has this formula. And if we just look at the current, so this is something of the form uh, of the vector fields themselves, but the point is that here we have only derivatives of A and B, so if we are to multiply this by the vector field T, yeah. by, the, by the Killing vector field T, then we get, we get zero. So this, uh, so this is this property that E times J is equal to zero. Okay, so that's uh, so this gives in some sense the structure that one can hope one needs to have in order to uh, be able to think of the problem. And I'm going to describe a result that uh, so, so this old work with, uh, with Sergio Kleinerman. I'm going to describe a second result that Sergio and I proved on the. Um, uh, on the solutions of these equations. Um, now, in order to be able to state this, um, I need to make a change of coordinates. It turns out that the original coordinates that I wrote, they are the most standard ones that can be used, but in order to do analysis, one really needs to go all the way to the horizon. And in fact, we'd like to go even a little bit beyond the horizon, which is a trick that, uh, uh, a trick that seems to be in the paper of Mark Zola, Metta, that are in Tohonan, to go a bit beyond the horizon. So we have, uh, and so in order to be able to, to go beyond the horizon, we need to put a system of coordinates that uh, lets us go beyond the horizon. And the system of coordinates, we need to remove essentially the singularity around the horizon. And uh, they, they are simple change of coordinates that do that. And after we do that, the metric has a slightly different form, uh, at least uh, around the horizon, but uh, uh, it's still, um, so it's still, I, I, I didn't write it down, but uh, it's going to be, the advantage is this, no, this time it becomes smooth at the horizon. Turns out that this particular surface, even though it's i is equal to a constant, this is a null surface. And one, one, once one goes a little bit beyond the horizon, it becomes a space-like surface. So the estimate that we'd like to do, if you want to think, if you want to think without that you are not impaired, the estimate would be of the type that we have here a space-like surface, here another space-like surface, and here another space-like surface. So this is more like the geometric picture. And we have the, so, uh, so we have the vector field, D1, D2, D3, and D4. And the space, 
as long as we are only looking for H1, it's very easy to define the space. So the correct H1 space that has to do with this problem is in such a way that uh, all of these vector fields are in L2, all of these vectors E, F, and M are in L2. And it turns out that one needs is that phi and psi in H1, and psi divided by sin theta, sin theta is in L2. So this is the space at the level of H1. One, one can also make sense of this in uh, for H2 and so on. One has to be a little bit careful with these components. And um, now, so I'm going to uh, discuss an estimate that we probe. Um, now, one can prove energy estimate. Well, what we are doing is we are proving simultaneous estimates. So the simultaneous estimate, it turns out that we are in the active symmetric case, and it's not too hard to prove simultaneous estimates in a way that, uh, so in a way that's similar to to this, to to the work of uh, uh, Marzola, Metcalf, Tatar, and Tohanen. Now, to prove simultaneous, we want to prove a little bit more. So, we want to prove a simultaneous estimate even stronger, in the sense that we only use as energy, so we use something that can decay. If one uses basic L2 energy that uh, just puts the, the usual L2 norm in the in the uh, the usual gradient norm in the energy, then that cannot decay. Now, we wanted to do uh, an estimate that's stronger than that and with an energy that can decay in order to gain decay at the same time. Uh, so the energy that we use, we, we define the so-called outgoing energy density. So the outgoing energy density only takes some derivatives. So for one function, we take uh, d1, so d1 over r, that's the normalized, uh, the normalized spherical derivative. Uh, we don't take both the dt and the dr derivatives. We take only the null direction dr plus dt. And then we combine, so the other, the other derivative, the, the dt and the dr derivatives, they are taken in a way that they decrease at infinity. And the exact combination, so the powers of r are very important, the exact combination is that, so uh, the, way, the way to think about it is that uh, one has the spherical derivative with weight one, the null derivative with weight one, and uh, the derivative, the derivative, uh, the, the dr and all the other derivatives with uh, the outgoing null derivative with weight one and all the other derivatives with weight one over r squared. And the function phi also comes with one over r squared. That's the correct approach. And then, so we do this thing for phi and psi. Now for psi, we need to be careful that our, uh, so the, what we call the angular derivative, of course, uh, has to carry, so the angular de derivative also carries uh, psi squared over sine theta squared. So this is the combination. Now, uh, we're only in the axially symmetric uh, case, so it's not, uh, the estimates are not, not as complicated at that level. Uh, and one critical ingredient that we need is that the set of trap null, null zero digits, they are confined into a co-dimension one set. The ones that are relevant, uh, so, so the relevant trap null zero digits are confined to a co-dimension one set. One doesn't have to do a uh, very complicated analysis at that level. It's almost as, as we could think that we're in Schwarzschild. This would always be the case in Schwarzschild. In, in the general case of, uh, of uh, care spaces, this, is, this will not be true. But because, because we are in the actually symmetric case, uh, then we can still find one surface and uh, work as if, uh, as if that's the, so, so as if we are in Schwarzschild. And the spherical. You can put that, but, but for, for two and three, you have to put the weaker combination in order to make it decay. And D1 is normalized, so that's D1 over R squared, that's, that's the strong derivative. Okay, so the, the surface to look at uh, in the care space is a very explicit surface. There's a solution of the equation, and the equation is R2 minus 3MR squared plus H squared R plus MA squared. It turns out that turns out to be through the calculation, and it has an exact solution the solution R star that's really close to M. That's uh, uh, close to M within H squared over M. Okay, so now I'm going to say now the main theorem, the, the, main, the main theorem that we have. So we are looking at uh, a Schwarzschild space of a fixed mass, and we assume that A is very small, <coughs> and we assume that we, are, we, we plan on going beyond the horizon uh, up to a very small number. So we have a, a constant that's slightly below the horizon. Uh, and we assume that we have, uh, on some time t, assume that we have uh, a solution 
of the system. So the system, now I'm only going to put nonlinearities in the right hand side uh, because uh, it seems it's much simpler to say things in terms of the nonlinearities. We are looking at solution of the system with nonlinearities. And then the conclusion is that we, we can construct this so called uh, R, uh, this, this, so we, cons we construct a family of weights. So the family of weights, uh, if you think of, there are several terms here. So if you look at this term, you will have the energy on every slice, and the energy of every slice will take out the so we take out these outgoing energies and then we multiply it by certain powers of R to the alpha. And then uh, the simultaneous estimate that we prove is the fact that if we look at this energy, this E alpha energy, uh, if we look at the E alpha energy at the fixed time, that, that controls the E alpha energy at the final time, uh, plus a strong bulk term, and the strong, uh, there's also the, the contribution of the nonlinearity, but let's not think about this now. And uh, and the strong bulk term, uh, the bulk, the bulk term that we get for the space-time integral, which would be here, uh, is of the form has also the same weight in front r to the alpha divided by m to the alpha, and then it has several components. So first of all, it has the gradient, the the uh, the first component, uh, which is the um, the spherical component, uh, divided by uh, with the coefficient r minus r star squared in front, so that has to do with the, with the trapping on the set, so the, the estimate on the first term de deteriorates when r is equal to r squared, uh, r star. Then we have the second terms that are of the form L phi and L psi squared, and then we have another term that's of the form 1 over r squared, phi squared plus psi squared, and then we have, uh, and then we have the r derivative, also the coefficient of m squared over r cubed. So you can see that the r derivatives, they are weaker by r squared than the l derivative. And then we have the dt derivatives, which are also weaker by a factor of r squared at infinity than the, uh, than the l derivative, but it all they also carry uh, the, the coefficient that vanishes on the, uh, the coefficient that vanishes on the, uh, on the surface r is equal to r star. If we just imagine, if we just examine it, if you pretend, uh, if you pretend that there are no, if you pretend that r minus r star is the same as r, uh, then this energy, all of those terms in the energy, they are basically one over r times the terms in the uh, in the outgoing energy. So that's that's the point of working this outgoing energy. Is that the terms that we get in the bulk are exactly one over r. So for example, this term here in the in the, in the energy, it had, uh, it was like one over r squared. Here is one over r cubed. Here we have the same thing. This, this was m squared over r squared. Now this m squared over r cubed, and then the, the same are the others. So as long as we put this specific kind of energy, then we get we get the ones in the bulk term to be exactly one over r, and this immediately starts starts in truth because we have a full range of alpha, and we can get out of this c to the minus two decay, almost c to the minus two decay, of the of the outgoing energy. So just out of the just out of the the first uh, initial mass. Okay, so this was the so this was this was the description of the problem, and uh, now I'm going to give some ideas about the proof. Uh, and also, so the also there is this uh, nonlinear term because in principle I'm not going to discuss much more about the nonlinear. In principle, of course, uh, one has to put the semi-linear expressions that we have. So the nonlinearities they are not zero in principle. One has to think about that. And it turns out that the, uh, the part that contains the nonlinearities also has this kind of shape. So it also can be expressed in terms of the outgoing energy. Okay, so now how do we uh, do this? And so we use this method that we learned from the paper of Marzola, Metzhoff, Tatar, and Tohaniano, the method of simultaneous inequalities in which uh, one tries to get, so one tries to get control if one looks at this picture, one tries to get control of the flux to this surface, the flux to this surface, and the bulk, uh, all of them in terms of the uh, surface integral of in the first set, in the, in the lower set. Uh, also, uh, this the idea somehow to, to think that there, there, there was an earlier work using this R-weighted estimate, at least along the null hypersurface. So one can also think of uh, doing null hypersurface. So on, on null hypersurfaces, uh, this, this was used before by uh, Dr. Emerson Orlianski and also by uh, a student in Princeton. Uh, 
So it's always been convenient. So, uh, uh, so the main point is to get simultaneous pointwise decay. And uh, once we get the simultaneous pointwise decay, we also, uh, so the, the outgoing energies, they will decay like e to the minus, two minus alpha. In principle, we can also put more vector fields in order to get pointwise decay. So this will be decay of the energy, but if you put, if one puts this, like with the rotational symmetries and other symmetries with the GR symmetry, then uh, then one gets um, one gets more interesting. Uh, now we use energy estimates, and of course we have several issues as a, uh, uh, compared to the uh, compared to the uh, to the problem without to the wave equation. And uh, one of the main issues is the fact that our energy momentum tensor is not as precise. Is the, the, there is a, uh, there is a bulk there. Okay, so now I'm going to describe what we use. So uh, let's pretend that there are no nonlinearities, so, so, so it says not to have to write them down. And what we construct is, and we construct a vector field P that we construct out of the energy momentum tensor and the functions phi and psi. And the form is the following. So P depends on, uh, there, are three, uh, there are four things in the problem. X, W, so the multiplier is X, W, and then M prime. And uh, the vector field P depends on all of them. So it's Q times X plus W times phi E mu plus psi S mu. And then we have D mu W phi squared plus psi squared. And one more term on phi squared plus psi squared. And then if we go back to the equation satisfied by two, then we get a divergence identity for P. And the divergence identity has several terms. So first of all, we have the term uh, X times J that was coming from the fact that our first divergence identity was not, uh, was not, uh, had, had, uh, had the term, um, uh, our first divergence identity had uh, uh, a term that, uh, that was not zero. Uh, then we have Q times phi. So this, uh, so if X was a killing vector field, this wouldn't come in. But if it's not a killing vector field, then that's, that's the term that's gonna provide positivity of the space time integral. Uh, then we have a Lagrangian term. The point of the, s uh, of, the uh, of the weight W is morally to uh, make uh, the term in the first line of the space-time integral to make it positive. And the only way that's positive, that can be made positive, is to uh, to allow for Lagrangian term. And then we have uh, phi times m times grad, uh, uh, so phi times m times grad phi, and then we have phi squared. And so they are written. Uh, at the l in some sense, the, the level of the maximum number of, of derivatives, so the first term at the top line would be at the, the, the first order of derivatives, then the second term is zero order times first order, and the last term is the zero order of derivative. I want you to keep in mind, however, that the hardest part is not to prove a positivity of the first order terms, it's to prove a positivity of the last term. So just to get the positivity of the last term, that's uh, that's the, that, that requires the most work. And, uh, um, and also in the, in the, so th this is the surface integral. In the surface integral, I can also integrate by parts. In the bulk integral, one cannot integrate. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to, so now this is the, so just to recall, these were the objects we were looking at. We were looking at the three vector fields, E, F, and M. And they're looking at the energy momentum tensor, Q, which is, the usual energy momentum tensor built out of EF and M, and we have J, which is the current that's left after uh, the after the uh, the divergence. And there is one more problem, which is that our current, if we just look at the current, it has a derivative of the form d mu a over a. Now, if the vector field that we are applying is the T vector field, the the um, the the, the killing vector field, it doesn't matter. But if we are planning on using other vector fields, then this d mu a over a, of course, is very important. It's going to create a singularity that's worse. In some sense, it's worse than, uh, than the maximum no number of derivatives you'd be allowed to have. So what we need to do is to correct that. So we need a further correction of the uh, vector field P. And we take this, uh, this first order correction and we subtract it. And it turns out that after we subtract it, we can replace the, uh, the J term with, there's only one term really that's, uh, that's problematic there, and we subtract off this term uh, by replacing the zero to order correction uh, on, the, 
uh, on the surface of the ocean. Okay, so now basically we have, so we have uh, most of the ingredients that we need to uh, run the probe. So in order to be able to run the probe, what we need is to arrange, ultimately the whole thing becomes a game in arranging these multipliers in order to get everything positive. And there are lots of terms because we can look at what do we need to get positive. We need to get all of those terms positive without the right to integrate by parts and all of these terms positive with the right to integrate by parts. Uh, so in order to achieve all of this, we get we use uh, four multi we use four multipliers. So the multipliers are of the form x, w, m, and m prime, and we use four of them. So there's the first one, which is in the trap region, which would be, it actually extends all the way to the horizon, but is most relevant in the region around the traps that are is equal to 3m. And here we use exactly the same multipliers in the paper Mars, Roland, or Castle Parent of an anon. And uh, this multiplier is very good to get uh, some of the first order terms positive uh, with the correct coefficient. So they also, the, if we remember what we want to do for the space-time intervals, we also have to have those factors in front of them because otherwise it wouldn't be possible to get them positive. Um, so that's, um, so there, there's a certain shape that, uh, uh, that, that gets those to be all positive. Um, now, so um, this has to be correct. As one approaches the horizon, it turns out that if one just does those kind of multipliers, they don't work well at the horizon. The horizon, there's another, there's a correction that goes to the redshift vector here. In the redshift vector, it can be very well combined, so it's just, uh, it works very well. Uh, so, so it works very well as a correction near the horizon. And uh, again, we use pretty much the same, uh, the same construction as Mars, Roland, or Castle Parent of Hanna, with the, with the additional ve uh, redshift vector field. Um, now, so far, we solved the wave equation. So far, we didn't think about the, uh, the, new, the new ingredient, which is the, uh, this new term J that we have to think about. But now we have to start thinking about it. It turns out that the, the contribution of this uh, term J is not too relevant near the horizon. Already, we took out the, so we took out the, uh, the, the piece, the, the highest order derivative piece, so that's, uh, so, so that's why we weaken it enough near the horizon, but there's still a trap region around, which turns out to be kind of, so it turns out to be a region between R star and 4M for some reason that I can't quite tell why it is. It turns out that there's a region between R star and 4M where if we just use the, uh, the multipliers that we're working for the wave equation, we get something that's negative. It doesn't have the right sign. But in that region, we can further correct. So it turns out that uh, the, the, the structure for the psi is stronger because we have a stronger energy. Not only we know uh, psi in H1, but we know psi divided by sine theta in L2. So we have a stronger energy, so we can correct that. So we can put a new multiplier closer to that, uh, to that region, and um, we can correct, uh, so we can correct the term, so we can correct this term uh, that, was, uh, that, that was coming from the J. And now in order to be able to get the outgoing energy, we have to, co uh, to, to construct a suitable multiplier at infinity, and this is, it's a little delicate. So in order to get everything positive, it's in your best interest to put a big multiple of dt at the end, because that will make all the, that will make the vector field more time-like, and that will be, uh, that will make, uh, that will make the, the surface intervals positive without affecting the bulk, the bulk integral. Now, it turns out that in our problem, we cannot, we are not allowed to put a big multiple of dt at the end, because that's gonna produce energies that are not outgoing. So the only way we can deal with it in order to keep things positive inside and not getting too big at infinity is to construct a multiplier, a vector field of this form. So we have a vector field that's F, you should think is like R to the alpha divided by M to the alpha. And then G would be a function that's very big uh, at the beginning and it becomes very small. So it's a combination. So F grows and G decreases. So G is going to be very big and almost constant for a long time. And uh, at infinity, it decreases in order not to, it has to decrease in order not to mess up with the, you know, with the, with the outgoing character of the energy. So that's, uh, so this is the, so, so then we put everything together and we collect all the terms and at the end of the day, we 
are able to get the positive, uh, uh, the positive, uh, the, the, the we are able to get all of these terms are positive. So if we look back at, at the theorem, we can get, we can get a positive, uh, the integrals on the surface to be positive, and we can get all the terms in the bottom to be positive. So that's the, so in principle now, given that one gets, as I said, one gets uh, two to the power two minus, two to the power two minus alpha dk for the square. So this, this is almost one over t dk directly out of the, one also has to give up some out of derivatives in order to get rid of these terms. So if one starts with more derivatives at time zero, then one gets, uh, one gets, uh, one gets pointwise decays at the low order of derivatives. And that in principle can be used to study, to go back to the nonlinearities. And we go, we can go back to the nonlinearities and uh, look at the full, at the full semi-linear uh, So that's, um, so this is the, uh, the plan. Of course, if we go back to what we really want to do, which is this uh, simplest possible nonlinear stability question. Now it's easy to see that, uh, this is still very far. In my mind, it's still very far. I know that there are other people who are working on it, but this is still very far because we depend very much on, in order to, to run this argument, we depend very much on knowing that the metric is Schwarzschild. Imagine that you have a metric that's not exactly Schwarzschild, it's not stationary. So then, the old, uh, unless you can make it convert somehow, but uh, how are you going to make it converge? It's not, uh, so the, the, the all of these theorems that I describe here, including this one, are basically statements when you fix the metric and you run either a linear problem or semi-linear problem. But the, the problem in which the metric can change it as well, it should be the full, uh, the full nonlinear stability that seems to be pretty open. In fact, I'd be very happy if you even to just reach time one over epsilon squared. So start with metric that start the perturbation at size epsilon, then one go to B constant over epsilon squared, which would be like equal constant over epsilon cube. A state and even that I think would be easy. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you. We don't see t minus r because our weights depend, uh, don't depend on t. t minus r is as bad as one. In principle, you could say you could improve that. So t minus r, in the way we see it, is through one. That's why you have one over r squared. We don't, we cannot see t minus r over one. But we what want to see that the next step. There, there is more one can do. So it's uh, one could one would have to see it at the next step. I, I would be very happy. I mean, this is stronger than the actual geometry. We are only looking at, uh, at the Schwarzschild case. So we don't have any angular. It's possible to restrict just the Schwarzschild case because we, this d part can be zero if it starts out at zero. I, I, I'm not saying that there's no hope. Of course not. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what w the goal would be. But, um, you know, I'd be very happy to reach time deconstruct over epsilon squared. Before one does that, it's hard to see how one could do much more. I mean, already starting with data of size, it, it, you know, the problem is that you have, you have a metric, and let's say with initially you don't know where you are within epsilon. If you are thinking just of this trap surface, r is equal to 3m, you don't know where you are. You're, you're, you know within epsilon where you are. And what you really need to do is to show that this trap surface builds up. Presumably at time 1 over epsilon squared, you should be only uncertain by 1 over epsilon squared, because otherwise there's no progress. And uh, so it's very, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting problem. Thank you.